Really, dog, enough with the bloody light bulbs already. Four different switches. Okay. Hmm. The nefarious side of me wants to know. How exciting. Now blow the light bulbs up and catch the damn roadrunner or whatever. Okay, I'll do it. Hmm, properly. You're all familiar with the light switch, but the key switch basically works as both being pressed by the mouse and having the key on the keyboard depressed. Unlike the switch, the key or the mouse must remain depressed. Releasing either means turning the switch off. The hand holding the mouse activates when the mouse clicks anywhere. Well, in this case, anywhere in the game itself. Wait. Okay, it actually recorded the click in the mouse up event before losing focus. So now the widget workshop is not in focus anymore, the click doesn't work anymore. That's interesting. Anyway, the mouse without a hand on it. Oh, those are the old single button mice. Only reacts as I drag. The arrows indicate the drag is being registered. As Doc explains, it technically is measuring distance, but for our purposes, any distance other than zero will turn a light on. Okay, we can activate all these inputs at once, right? Switch is set to on, I press down A, actually I want to do C. Fun fact, I can only select letters and numbers, no special characters, and certainly no unicorn Egyptian hieroglyphics. Unicode. Egyptian. Hieroglyphics. I meant Unicode. Whatever. I can, however, set the key to nothing. No, that doesn't make the space bar work, it just means the button now only reacts to mouse clicks on it. Back to C. I toggle the switch, hold C, click anywhere, then drag, and then all the inputs will react at once. I'm not moving the mouse. How is that on? Oh, for a split moment between releasing the mouse and the slight drag as the widget is goad, it records the ever so slight distance, enough to technically not be zero. Oh. It's a total, of course. Clicking doesn't start a new measurement. It adds to the last measurement made. A music puzzle. So, there is no way four outputs can connect to one input. It would appear that four comparison operators and four numbers are visually stacked on each other. Pressing S would pick a random number, I'm guessing either between zero or three or one to four. And then there are four note blocks stacked on each other, connecting to four splitters, connected to four speakers, also stacked on each other, with some more stacked logic. Essentially, only one of these stacks has a true input, and pressing the right note, either B, C, D, or A, completes the truthiness of the AND gate and updates the total. I've done music puzzles before, but this is more of a perfect pitch detection, not an intervals detection. I don't have perfect pitch, like, at all. Okay, that's my anchor. I'm going to assume that the note order from left to right means that A after D is actually high A, not the lower one before B. As I get these right, I'll remember the anchors and if the next pitch was higher than that. Or it can just keep giving me the same note, whatever works. Thanks for giving me the same note like a billion times in a row. Poor D, never had a chance. For the first skip from B to A, it didn't, I didn't know that was A, it just sounded like a really large jump. Wait, hang on. That was some interesting air work, but did I need to do that? Oh, my nefarious sense is just burning my blood in all the right ways now. First, there is no penalty to getting the wrong note. I can hit them all and see what increments the total. Okay, I probably need to start the randomizer so that at least one note has a signal. And it's not reset. The answer is still the same. It's unfortunate you are hoping to play by your rules, but I play by my own. Hmm. 
more light bulbs. Oh, give me a... F oh dear, that is a mess. Okay, ignore the mess and think logically and directly. That AN gate needs two truth signals. We will worry about the other gates only if we find need for them. Starting at the bottom input, we follow the rail track that is currently set to listen for the top input. There is no top input, so this track must be switched. The next track has the exact same problem. And the one after that, same problem. Oh, another AND gate. We need this to be true. Let's start with the bottom track. The bottom input is easy. The top input, that track is already set correctly. The top input comes from the track all the way up here. That track is set correctly. Its input comes from the track behind it, which is not set correctly. Flip the track and then hit the switch to send the truth signal all the way through. Okay, now the bottom part of the AND gate is operational. The top input, that track is set. Well, we have a choice, don't we? Perhaps one direction is completely impossible or both are alternate ways. Let's start with the top. There's an XOR. Oh, two direct switches. Remember, flip one, not both, and that should be what we need. Just for kicks, let's look at a possible alternate solution. The bottom path we already saw and it looks pretty locked in in terms of what our options are. So if we flip the toggle, then that means we need to make this rail track here too. It's already set to the right track. Working up to flip it is not even possible. The track that it is connected to doesn't have any inputs connected to anything. So this switch it is. A diabolical adder? How nefarious. Looks like everything's connected, so nothing's to drag in and fix. I guess hit go and find out what it does. Hmm, I probably need to actually hit that giant acme switch. It would appear as though two numbers are picked, and the number entry in the center must be added to the number on the left to get the number on the right. So I am solving for x in the y plus x equals z thing, which basically means I am solving for z minus y. So this diabolical adder is solved by subtracting. Subtract the left number from the right number to get what the center number should be. Oh, I have but 10 seconds. Okay, each 10 seconds, new numbers are chosen, so I have five seconds to solve, and then I have the remaining five seconds to use this, use my mouse abilities to enter the number slowly on that calculator lookalike and hit enter. I hate having to do arithmetic under pressure. One wrong mistake and the entire internet will think I'm an idiot. Oh, goddess damn it. Ah, uh, a puzzle that flout out admits that there is more than one way to solve there are no parts in the parts bin. We can only move what's already there. Well, we can also delete them and put them back, but that doesn't really count. And certainly not to 10. Speaking of counting, I see a lot more ways to count to 10 than two. I see at least three ways rather than two to count to 10. First way, smack a key a lot, my favorite. Make that ASC and then connect it to that hand counter and then to the comparison operator and go. Success. Okay, method two, connect button to start timer. When it reaches 10, bit slower than jam on the keyboard method, but does not decrease keyboard longevity as much. Technically, each tick of the clock sends out the next integer in the sequence, which the counter treats as a reason to count. So in a roundabout way, I could connect the stopwatch to the counter too for the same result. Okay, now that metronome. And there it goes. Um, eventually. Okay, enough of this. Why 
stop there. I just figured out a way to use all pieces together. Set the fast metronome to the stop section, set the key to the start section, and then double click and change the signal to react to the stopwatch turning off and on. Then attach the counter to the comparison. Now, hold down the key and observe. And that is the fastest way to count to 10 in Widget Workshop. How long would it take to count to like 999 though? One moment. Okay, go even further. Constantly send a permanent stop signal and a permanent start signal. Count. Count for me, my darlings. Count. Count. Higher. Break the widget. Break the widget. And I'm satisfied. Anyway, I hate dogs. I also dislike pets of any kind. I am not an animal person. Right, anyway, widgets. Okay, make the dog bark 30 times in one minute. So one dog bark every two seconds, or perhaps 30 barks in less than a second. Okay, looks like what's here is here. I can't move anything. I can only make connections. Let's start anyway and see what it does whilst half broke. What the oh my god is Hylia? Make it stop! Make it stop! Oh, this will also stop the dog barking noise. How wonderful. So the pendulum makes a signal every time the ball swings over the middle. A very annoying signal. That signal can then be sent to the dog, which is then split to the speaker to actually convert the sound signal to an actual sound, and then sent to the total, where it is converted to a single one input and increments the value. The total needs to be fed. Hmm. I need a connector to that comparator with the 30. Once it breaks the 30, it can pass through the comparator and send a true signal to the top input of the AND. But the bottom needs to be true too, and therefore I have to connect the less than comparator to it. This all depends on the pendulum being fast enough. I guess technically I don't need to connect the pendulum to the dog, I could just connect it directly to the total and not have to hear that stupid thing. But I have the sound off anyway, so who cares? Okay, I can turn the sound back on. In case anyone is annoyed, I turn the sound off and couldn't experience the puzzle the way it's meant to be experienced. You want to hear that? Really? Maybe I should have kept the sound off. Eh, let's keep it on. The annoying thing was the metronome. Roosters are funnier and that metronome isn't here, so, okay. Another make something happen n times before z seconds is up. 40 crows, 60 seconds. What do we have to work with? Even if I won't use it, it pays to have everything available to me. Eh, yeah, don't want to make too much mess. Those are obvious. Keep them there. Oh, a heart. Taken out of its home. How very ancient Mayan of you. Well, without access to my stopwatch for the super fast count, something else will have to do. Something that can count fast. So heart weight and pulse rate are constant values, whereas on during heartbeat goes on and off as the heart beats. So we pick an animal with a fast heartbeat. Unless the human adult heartbeat is sampled during a moment of intense fear or having their crush come onto them, we have to use a different... Wait, don't gerbils have... Yep, we got our counter. Now to hook it up to the rest of the system. Because of that, I don't see needing a metronome, so I'll cut that out for now. Okay, start with the rooster. The heart beats and activates the rooster. We can use the totals to count up the number of noises. We can then connect the total to the comparator. We then cheat by not even bothering to start the timer since zero is indeed less than or equal to 60. If you didn't want me to cheat the game, you should have connected a zero number to the stopwatch stop area and added another AND gate to ensure the timer number is greater than at least one. That would learn me, but you didn't. <laughs> Congratulations, you've just recorded your first number one. Huh? What's this nefarious scheme? So what exactly am I doing? Those giant billboards at the top are... Giant billboards. And they show their text when given a signal. 
So I have to somehow send a true signal to all of them in order to enter the right number. And it looks like no cheating. I need to use the number spinner to connect to the comparator down here so I can actually enter my answer. But the AND gates ensure that a true signal must be flowing throughout the rest of the widget or my answer wouldn't mean anything. Oh, what's this? I can mess with any connection? Oh my. Okay, I'll try this the normal way. Then I want to see how I can make this widget beg for my mercy. Okay, I'll start by hitting go and seeing what happens. Your first clue is free. I don't need your stupid clue. Oh, right, the signal still needs to... Damn you. Connect the parts shown to get your next clue. How wonderfully helpful. Well, my first obvious choice is sending a signal to that two splitter. That will switch the train tracks away from the permanent zero. I could then connect something else, like say a permanent one. And that signal is sent to the, wait, equal to 125, well, okay. And that goes to the AND gate, which takes a true signal from earlier. This should be the second clue. Let's go ahead and reveal it and, and before finishing the rest of this. I'm sure that clue will be much more helpful. To get your last clue, use the parts you have left to start up the... The thing. The fiendish thingy. The loud, annoying pendulum. Which is what I was already going to do. No, I will not listen to that hell again. So, taking advantage of the fact that I can cut any wire I want, I'm going to cut the wires connecting the metronome and connect the AND gate directly to the splitter and then have the splitter directly to the AND gate to get around the metronome completely. Okay, this is why I needed the billboard anyway. I do need the actual number. And with the comparison checking out and the number passing to the AND gate, let me just check something. <sighs> Truly, Doc, your widgets do not have the best of locks. Okay, Doc, you're really getting me worried here. Oh, I can mess with the title. I can't mess with anything else, but I can modify the title. That's better. Anyway, this is a slight variation on the light bulb on turning on thing. It's not enough to set the switches to turn on the light bulbs, but they need to work with the extra choose signal that is going to be sent by holding down A. Each light switch seems to go to one input of the two input gate, whilst the other comes from the A holding. Now only XOR is going to be the wild card here. And gates need the A signal anyway. Or gates don't care. But an XOR gate can mean a correct setting with A unpressed becomes an incorrect setting. Recall that XOR means one or the other, but not both. Must be a true signal. First set. Second switch matters not, as the additional true signal flips the OR gate regardless. The first switch is connected to the second XOR gate. And that must be off, actually. This turns a light off now. But if I hold A, then all is well. Second set, first switch doesn't matter. Second switch connected to AND gate must be on. Do that in test. First switch tied to AND and must be on. Second switch tied to XOR and must be off. The logic here is pretty much becoming. If you connect to an AND gate, you must be on. If you connect to an XOR gate, you must be off. If you connect to a OR gate, you don't matter in the grand scheme of things and your existence is but meaningless to the cosmic powers that be. Oh, sorry, it got a bit dark there. Last one, same deal, but backwards. First switch tied to XOR, must be off. Second one tied to AND, must be on. Hope we are done with the bloody lights, kiddo. <laughs> Throw a baseball on the moon? Have you tried asking NASA, like, really nicely? Perhaps we need another moon expedition. Now that'd be a waste of money. Let's build a program instead. This isn't as particularly obvious if you aren't familiar with the available widgets. And whilst at it, let's pull everything else out. And let's put that right back. I like my ears too much to listen to that pendulous void. 
I'll just use a human heart. It's a little technique I picked up earlier in ancient Maya. To keep things simple, I'll now just have a light switch. If I need anything more complex, I'll get it later. Looks like the puzzle is giving me a choice of inputs from manual to timed automatic. I'll just keep the heart and switch for now. Okay, so what exactly was the giant billboard I pulled out? And what happened to the cannon that was in the image that was in the parts bin? Well, this effectively puts together projectile motion calculations into a single part. You have a metaphorical cannon that provides the initial velocity, and the gravity preset determines how fast the cannonball will fall. Recall from the gravity chamber that without wind resistance, the actual item falling isn't as important, so a cannonball is perfectly acceptable as a baseball for now. It's even spherical, so yay! The height is how high up the cannon is. Now, this is where I think there might have been a tiny, teeny bit of a miscommunication in the graphics department. The image shows a cannon facing upwards diagonally and firing, but the part in the playfield shows the ball already at the top left. And the speed control is just that, a speed, not a velocity. It has no vector that indicates a direction. Given the absence of any degrees on this control, I get the sense that the ball is launched horizontally, or rather perpendicular to the force of gravity. So ignoring the whole upwards facing cannon and, and mentally substituting this for a cannon at some given height, firing horizontally, the control makes a lot more sense. Anyway, what's up with what Doc wants us to do? Baseball on the moon? Well, since gravity is not the moon's gravity quite obviously, so let's change that. Pretty sure Doc is not strong enough to send this baseball with the force of an Apollo launch. Hey Doc, you said how far you could throw it. You didn't say how far a professional could throw it. And I've seen you throw. You suck. Eh, this, then this will just drop. There is no in-between launching speed between nothing and professional baseball player. Also, not an expert, but I am pretty sure Doc is not as tall as Mount Everest. Now granted, I don't see him that often, but context clues based on the size of the doors in this laboratory and the fact he has been able to come in and out seems to suggest his height is a little bit more standard. For a dinosaur, that is. Dinosaurs are dangerous, and I think it is very important that we know how far they can throw baseballs, not accounting for their stubby hands, and Doc doesn't always tell me everything about his experiments. So for all I know, look, I'm not saying it's dinosaurs, but it's dinosaurs. Okay, last piece is the output. As height decreases due to gravitational acceleration, the height will drop to zero as this control executes. On when hits, acts as a sort of timer. You can still calculate distance if you know the force vectors and the time, but this control thankfully already gives us a distance output. Speed is a bit odd. I mentioned earlier that speed has no direction. Let's take a quick detour. The graph on the right has a range of 1000 to 5000, and it will record the value changes for 10 seconds. The cannon control is set to output speed, and I have it set to a rifle bullet, which is where my graph minimum of 1000 is coming from. And the gravity is the sun, so it is going to fall very fast even from that high of a height. Hitting the C button will reset the graph, which had the audacity to start without me being ready, and will activate the cannon, at which point the graph will be recording the total speed. The speed is slowly increasing. By the way, I am not using an acne switch because it would otherwise send a continuous true signal to that reset part of the graph, which prevented from ever graphing anything. And would you look at that? Basically, the force of gravity pulls it down. The force of the cannon blast is not bound by wind resistance, so it remains constant. This control speed is effectively the starting speed plus an increasing speed based on the acceleration of gravity. By the way, totally unrelated, but if I wanted to use an acne switch here, instead of the switch resetting the graph, I have a constant one signal reset it and the switch flips off the XOR gate to let it finally stop resetting when ready. See, XOR is indeed quite useful in a lot of places. What? What? Oh, give me a seriously? That was clever. I was being clever. I was totally super clever there, and the game went and decided to have a bug where constantly resetting the graph still advanced the graph's internal timer. Oh, my nefarious plans! Right, so I need a single toggle on this cannon. The output of distance needs to be fed into some input. The end part takes the input and basically truncates the decimal portion. It does not round. If I send 22.9 into int, 
it gets 22, not 23. The output then goes into the display and into the question box box. The display says it will be whatever number of feet because apparently no one likes the metric system and then wait. All this talk of velocities, speeds, tests, I've been neglecting something very important. Units. Units. If this thing outputs 1,500, then 1,500 what? The height is in feet. The launching speed is in miles per hour. I'm going to assume that internally it handles unit conversion properly, but when it outputs distance, what's the unit? It doesn't actually say. Is it distance in miles or in feet? If it's in feet, I'm already okay. If in miles, I have to wire up a conversion first before feeding it into int. And I have access to no such controls. I better bloody hope this thing already outputs in feet. All right, only one missing piece. I don't want to merely calculate this pitch. I want sound effects. After all, Doc th went through the trouble of putting that sound control up there. Be a shame if no one used it. So I'll connect the cannon system to the splitter so that we get sound. Connect the bottom splitter output to the end. Wait for the answer. Then smack the A button. And the pitch is off. The crowd is cheering maybe. Hard to hear over the heart. And they sound like aliens. 356 feet. And it's not the answer. Turns out, Doc is not a T-Rex after all. There's no way you're six feet, Doc. I'm taller than you and I'm still an inch off. The sound was annoying me. Let's use a regular acne switch, my favorite input type. Seriously, what tacky toys are making that noise? That's not crowd cheering, that's like a bubble being blown into a lake or something. Underwater pitching? Well, that would seriously mess up this calculation. The answer is not 195 feet. Wait, hang on. Doc says something is not corrected correctly. Oh, come on. The A key is attached to the wrong input. It should be the toggle so that a numerical value can pass through the bottom track. Whatever. About bloody time.